listening to conversations where teens and young persons can ask important questions of senior influence. A little about Bridging the Gap. This project is entitled Bridging the Gap. It is a program designed to establish positive relationships between seniors and youth. This initiative is part of the Power of One project, a collaboration of the Laventil Foundation and the Republic Bank of Trinidad and Tobago Limited. Bridging the Gap interviews with senior influencers in Trinidad and Tobago, episode 1 featuring Mango Patterson. Tell us a little bit about your youth, where you were born, your parents, siblings, and education. I was born in a village, in a, a, a sugar cane village. And my grandparents were indented laborers, and uh, having been born in 1946, it, you, you still had many of the indented laborers alive. So I benefited from that culture. But as a young person, I I was very bright because of the fact that I had this illness that affected me very bad. And for many years, and then when I became quite about 16 years old, then I started to live. Then I started to learn. So, put up the lack of learning up to the age of 16, I, 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 I became very vicious about standing first in class and, and being the brightest student amongst everybody else. And it became like a total preoccupation and I maintained that record from then until now. The illness and the opening up of my brain when I started exercising, um, that was a, the, most, the most significant event in my life, as I know it. Well, whatever education I got at the Ben Venue, a Presbyterian school in Laramine. Then from there, I got to know somebody called Dom Basil Matthews, who for me, was like a, what you call a mentor, a godfather to me. I went, barefooted boy, went up to his school, went into his office, and being from a very Hindu background, I went and touched his feet. He's a priest, eh? I went and touched his feet, and then he hugged me, and then he said, what do you want? I said, well, I want to come to college. Um, he said, but you, the entrance exam, and so has passed, all the formalities, of going to college has passed. However, in his goodness, he said, I will give you a makeup test. He did give me a test and I did pass to go to St. Mary's College. But the point is, because I was so late, I was one term late, they, I was at a, at a great disadvantage in that they placed me in a form one that was a one year old. So therefore, I couldn't pick up with the languages, I couldn't pick up with the sciences, and I remained like that. I, I told you, my learning never started until I was 60. So I remained like that until I reached Form 4. When I started to exercise and run, and, and that it was diabetes, right? So when that I got that over, and um, I started to excel in schoolwork at that age. At home at the same time, my father was an Indian classical singer. My mother, a whole family of musicians. My mother used to sing and she used to play the harmonium. At the tender age of about eight, she taught me just four notes on the harmonium. And within a week or so, that is where my talent lies. I started to compose music with these four notes. Just take four notes and start to make tunes. And then everybody was amazed and then gradually, everything that anybody could sing, I could play. Um, after a year or two, and that's how I started to accompany everybody in the little temples and it was mainly religious song, what you call bhajan. So I was accompanying all the bhajans and I knew well, every one of them. So I could, anybody singing in, in any key, I could play for them. Then shortly after that, I started to play the tabla um, and the dolak. Um, the dolak is a two-sided drum. The tabla is two drums standing next to each other. And then, when I was in St. Bendis College, I learned to read and write music from Major Dennison. There was a military band there, and I started to play the clarinet in the school band. And that was my first introduction to Western music. That, before that, I never even heard Western music. 
So I was only the sick, I only heard Indian music. And then um, from then on, I got a deep interest in learning more. And then I, I got a book by what, a fellow, an Italian guy named Nick Manolov on how to play the mandolin. Well, I, I started to read that book without having a mandolin and figuring out the music in it. And eventually, I got a mandolin for $20. I started learning mandolin, which I learned and I became quite good proficient in it. So much so that I played in the, one of the biggest bands in Trinidad, Harry Marby, the National Indian Orchestra. And I started playing different orchestras and so mandolin. But my parents, both of them, they were children, first children of indentured laborers. So you would imagine that they didn't have an education in English. But my father could have read Hindi and write Hindi. My eldest brother, who started to work as a laborer in Texaco and gradually went up to being like a refinery operator. My brother, after him, started to sweep a lawyer's office as a job and then studied again on his own and became, wrote the solicitor's exam, did the first one and then got a job in the bank and he became bank manager, area manager and that was his career. My third brother above me, he became what you call something like a marine engineer. After him is my eldest sister who was a housewife and who is living in the States right now. Then it's me and then a younger sister who was a teacher all her life and a younger brother who was more like a doing whatever he jobs he could get. What do you know as an adult that you wish you knew as a young person? How to interact with people. In what ways have you made a positive contribution to the lives of the youth of Trinidad and Tobago? What I should say, the tangible contribution is that I have taught over 7,000 students for free music. I've taught, as I learned, I taught. And, and they never had to pay to come and learn. It, I used the senior comprehensive school next door to me. And every weekend, it's just these 200 students. So that is the tangible effort that I made. But apart from that, I think that I gave the youth something to look up to because I chose an instrument that nobody else played in Trinidad or nobody was proficient in. And what I took that instrument to do, I took it, I didn't only keep it amongst the Indians. I took it and I started to use it to play music because my philosophy was that we are all children of God and inside of us there is one person that is a spark of the divine. And that spark of the divine that is in me makes you my relative because you have that spark of divine in you. And that philosophy is what took me to form my band. And I said, look, the only way to cross the barrier, I am playing an ancient instrument, the sitar, which you can see here, um, right? And this instrument, nobody in the world ever tried to do what I did with it. I played calypso with it, I played reggae, and I had a band around me of musicians who the only other Indian in the band was my son. I think the, the, the only credit I could take is that I was able to get musicians together under one roof and with a philosophy of love that pervaded everybody and that lasted for many, many years. And we still live like family, even though COVID and whatever have you. And it's only illness and a lack of mobility that causes us not to move. But yet we talk to each other at least twice a week. So that friendship that was inculcated between an Indian man and several non-Indian people was like if, if I might say, they were all of my race and they were all my brothers, you know, and sister. If you are youth in this present pandemic, what would be your primary focus? The focus would be study and more study. Try to develop the talent, the, the things that you didn't have time for all along. I would go and work on that because that is what I am doing. I am being, I am being my own youth at this age. I am thinking about myself as a young fellow when I told you that I couldn't learn until 16. And that urge to learn and that curiosity to learn has to be developed 
and it should always be towards becoming better, becoming a, a better person, being better able to communicate with your friends. I think the churches have a major role to play in teaching moral values um, to the children. And I think um, at this present moment, moral values is a very important thing. Very important that students focus a bit on moral values. When I was growing up, it took a village to grow up a child. How would you compare the life of a teenager in your day to the life of a teen now? The life of a teen now is, I, to me, sometimes I feel very scared for them. Parents in particular should sort of inculcate them, get them to, to become until they reach your age. Then we don't have to teach you anything again. You, at your age, you should have known all the moral values. And um, then you can sail through life. If you make a mistake, you, you have to have coping mechanisms how to bounce back. And that is what we, we are talking about. What advice would you give to young people now? My advice to young people is always try to stay motivated. And what are the things that make you motivated? Think about it. Be in good company. To start with, most important thing is good company. And I think also the church has an important role to play in that respect because you will find a better company among the church girls. Then there are youth groups, a youth fan side. What advice do you have for young aspiring musicians? I'll tell you, in my life, I use my life as an example. My music became commercial not because I knew how to market myself, because somebody else put me out there and that person made more money than I made. If you learn how to market yourself as a music person, that is, I would say, it will take care of 80% of your problem. Seriously, because the 20% that you remember you spend a lot of time honing your skills and becoming what you are. There comes a time in your life when you have to for, not forget, store what you learn already and just go into marketing and how to market yourself as a musician and go to some of these conferences and see how people do it and understudy somebody who does it. We have to talk, we have to understand without getting angry, without, you know, pulling down one another. And there needs to be more conversation, more dialogue, more explanation.